Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV. This week we're going to learn how to use PHP as a command line programming language on your Linux operating system. Also, we're going to be talking a little bit about where we should go when it comes to our external storage devices decisions, because right now we're at a very strange time when it comes to USB 3.x. Stick around. Live recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Welcome to the show, everybody. This is episode number 635 of Category 5 Technology TV. Before we get right into the show tonight, I want to remind you to subscribe to us on YouTube and also click the bell to be able to receive the notifications anytime we are live or when we post new videos. This week, as you probably heard, if you were watching on episode number 634, we were hoping to get started on our server upgrade this week uh, with regards to our storage server. We've got some fantastic uh, data center drives from Kingston Technology to put into our, uh, our server. And unfortunately, that is going to be a, a little bit more time consuming than we had been able to a lot this week. Apparently, what I've been learning is that it takes a little while to transfer 13 years worth of video content from one array to the other. So we're, uh, we're actually moving that over to uh, January 8th. Make sure you're here for that show. This week, we're going to be talking about uh, a couple of different things. Uh, for one thing, later on today, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, how to use PHP as a console language, as I mentioned at the top of the show there. And... Um, a little dilemma for you as we get into the show this week. A dilemma that I posed on Twitter is what type of external storage should we be investing in or looking at as far as the, uh, the technology goes for uh, a NAS or for uh, a uh, local on-site data backup, for example. So my question on Twitter was... All right, storage gurus, I have a computer with USB 3.0, and it supports UASP. That's uh, USB attached SCSI protocol. So full disclosure, of course, on the tweet, I didn't say this, but uh, the system that I'm actually hoping to set up is an Odroid XU4. So consider that for a second. An Odroid XU4 is a single board computer, a little tiny thing that would fit in my shirt pocket, but it has UASP compatible USB 3.0 built into that single board computer. So what that means is I can save and access data connected to that UASP port at bit rates of up to five gigabits per second, almost the throughput of an SATA hard drive, which is six gigabits per second. So imagine the speed of that. So a little single board computer, an external array that supports maybe four or five SATA hard drives, and thinking about that as a NAS solution so that we can create something that is ransomware um, basically protected against ransomware so that data backups are not able to be touched by a ransomware infiltration and also just to have a mass storage unit that is available for uh, for cloud access for data backups and things like that so that's my little like that's what I'm talking about as far as the device that I have and what I'm hoping to accomplish so my question and my dilemma that I pose to Twitter is this for my external storage purchase, would you go with a unit that supports, so this is the external unit, would you go with a unit that supports USB 3.0 with UASP, but also includes eSATA? Think about that for a second. Or 
would you, for the same price, switch over to a unit that has USB-C, USB 3.1, again, with UASP? So what's the difference? USB 3.0 with UASP will give you 5 gigabits per second, but that device will also give you eSATA. So that means the most amount of devices at the maximum speed. eSATA will give you 6 gigabits per second. Or USB-C, USB 3.1 will give me 10 gigabits per second. There have only been two replies so far. I just posed the question on Twitter. Perhaps Jeff, Sasha, could... Jeff, could you take a stab at the first one for me? So these are some of our viewers that have replied to this dilemma. Yes. So, and by the way, I love this question because I'm literally looking at doing it this at home right now with my Odroid XU4. I got to say, like, we're just at that time where the technology is is shifting and it's progressing so quickly. But do I, like, because I could use a USB 3.1 yeah. um, device plugged in to UASP, the USB 3.0 port, using a, uh, a USB-A to a USB-C adapter right. or a cable that has those two ends. But I'm going to lose the eSATA port. So do I throw away the eSATA port, Jeff, or do I, what, what do I do? So well, what does the community tell us? Okay, so No Man 5 says go with a 3.0 with eSATA. There's more options in case of future replacement or failover. Okay. And I'm thinking not only few, like just the, the, the diversity of devices, but also like, okay, I have USB 3.0 on my laptop, so I can plug it in and have like full 5 gigabits per second on that. Or I can plug it into my server, which has a 6 gigabit eSATA port. So then I'm getting 6 gigabits per second. So I've got this real universal compatibility going on. And, and really, do I need more speed than that for NAS? Mm -hmm. That's the question. Sasha, right. do you have another comment from our Yes, community? Pyros Rock says USB 3.1 Gen 2 will give you a much more future-proof product. Okay. Fair enough, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the latest and greatest technology. 10 gigabits a second. It's faster. But no, U, uh, no eSATA port. I've, I've We're split down the middle here, folks. 50-50. As far as Twitter goes, in this case, I think I would have to agree with No Man. Okay. Um, Expand upon that. Why? Well, So No Man says we want to go with the eSATA and USB 3.0. We're going to be throwing away 4 to 5 gigabits per second throughput but we're going to have that eSATA port so that we've got that maximum compatibility. And remember that USB 3.0, you can still plug it into a USB 3.1 device. Right. It's going to be forward compatible. You're just never going to get that 10 gigabits a second. Right. And, and I think if you're going to be running, you know, your at-home NAS or whatever through something like an Odroid, yeah. I, I think having greater flexibility is, is the safer approach in case something goes awry. Mm. Uh, I mean, if you were building an at-home server that was more stable as far as, like, it's a bigger unit, like, you know everything that's going into all the components, I think mm. going to 3.1 is the, is the way to go. But something like a... You're really not helping me here. You're keeping it divided, Jeff. <laughs> I, I Come know, on, I need a, I, I need a I definitive answer. I think that's where I'm going to go. Discord, what do you think? That's where you're going. Which way? You, right. just, you just suggested both, Jeff. Well... <laughs> Well, Albuquerque Turkey is saying, isn't USB 3.1 Gen 2 the current name for 10 gigabit PS per second, and, or per second and USB 3.1 Gen 1 the same as the old USB 3, which uh, makes no sense to me, <laughs> just to be clear. <laughs> But does it to so you? So what, what, what does it mean <laughs> as far as these devices go? We've got a 3.0 at yeah. 5 gigabits a second with eSATA. I mean, it's really, okay, it's an, it, it, are we at that point where the technology is, is shifting? And so it's like, do we want to be so future ready to be USB-C 3.1 Gen 2? Or, to, to put it into that context, but do we need that? Or do we go with eSATA? Jeff, what I, do you think? I think because you're running it through a, an SBC. A single board computer, yeah. Yeah, like, I, I, I don't think the 3.1 is the way to go. I mean, it's great to be future ready, but we are talking about an SBC that is so quickly going to change. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. mean, I suppose if you're looking at it from the standpoint of, well, I'm going to be getting a new SBC in a year from sure. now. Sure. 
then <sighs> or what if you what if you suddenly flipped it on its head and said you know what i'm going to get a uh i'm going to put a, a pci express usb 3.1 gen 2 a, a card on a pine 64 rock pro 64 then all of a sudden you've got a single board computer with usb c right and does it suddenly say okay well now we just want the speed so maybe we're getting into the realm of rhetorical now yeah maybe i'm saying oh, is speed more important than connectivity or is five gigabits per second at its base fast enough for a nas unit okay so i think it comes down to and I mean, I suppose with any bit of information, you're going to cha potentially change the answer. But what are you going to be doing with it that requires such a higher rate of speed transfer? Is like, are you going to be running regular backups? Are you running like hourly snapshots of your system? You know what? Honestly, Jeff, I don't even think that that matters. I think what Pyrus Rock's point is, is that it simply makes you more future ready because 10 gigabit per second is the current high-end standard. How so do you want to hold yourself back at five? How fast do they improve? Like Every couple of years, Sash, but years, I mean, yeah. 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 And, and the truth is, the truth of the matter, keeping in mind that the SATA controller itself is limited to six gigabits per second, okay? Right. So uh, a US, uh, SATA3 hard drives or, or like spinning drives that are plugged into that NAS unit, they're only going to run at six gigabits per second. So I'm going to maximize that in a JBOD environment with uh, eSATA. Mm -hmm. However, if I was to create, say, a, a RAID 1 plus 0, so keeping in mind that the, these devices will hold four or five individual hard drives and I can create a RAID within them, if I had a RAID 1, .0, uh, 1 plus 0, I w would theoretically be able to maximize that 10 gigabits per second. But again, what are you using it for? I think really, unless you're actually in real time, live decoding and encoding video, uh, like 4K video, I don't know that you would ever need that kind of speed. Well, but that's really? my that's my point. I mean, I, I, the whole idea of being future ready and running, you know, at ten megabits a second is great. But are gigabits, you, gigabits. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but are you going to use it to its capacity, or is it going to be an underwhelming usage? And I mean, as we're talking about this, I mean, what's going through my head is, look, I got an XU4, you've got an XU4. We're both looking at yeah. doing the same thing. This is the single board computer that you can buy for forty nine bucks that has USB three point oh. With what UASP. If, what if we just did both options? You go with the 3.1, I'll take the 3.0, and we'll set them up the same, and I don't know, we'll, <laughs> and we'll, then we'll death match them. That would be <laughs> fun. Like, I don't know. I could get behind Does, that. Would yeah. NEMS <laughs> monitor that kind of thing and see what? Oh well, you could just benchmark them, Jeff. I yeah. mean, realistically, you could benchmark them. But it, it, do I need that kind of? Do I need 10 gigabits a second for my backup? I don't think so. Hold on. As a tech guy, are you saying do I need? <laughs> the default answer is yes. Right. <laughs> Always. I need 20 gigabits exactly. per second. I, I need want the NASA computer. <laughs> what do you mean it only holds four hard drives? I need 40. I want Watson for my NAS. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it comes down to, I mean, what do you need your external device to be capable of and what what direction would you take? And why this is actually coming up this week and why this is an important question is because the technology is shifting in such a way that the choice no longer comes down to price. There is no choice to say, do I go for the 3.1 with 10 gigabits per second and pay a little bit more? Do I pay the little bit extra to get that extra speed? No, now it's no longer a choice because the price is one for one. Mm. Right. The price is exactly the same. That's the shift that we're seeing in, in this industry. So with that in mind, which direction do you want to take? Well, and Marshman just brings up an interesting point in the chat room saying, you're never going to get either of the five gig gigabits a second or 10 gigabits a section, sec Second, my goodness. Something about meatballs. <laughs> <laughs> and that's simply because of the one gig on your network. If you've got a network that's only... Okay, fair say. However, the Odroid XU4 is connected directly to it. 
So your Odroid, let's just say, hypothetical, right. it's plugged into your TV over HDMI, and you're using it for Plex Media Server, it's going to get the full 5 gigabits per second. Okay? Right. Or see, uh, if you're plugging it USB-C into your computer, you're going to get the full 10 gigabits per second on the USB-C model. Right. See, uh, with for our uh, TV upstairs, yes. we have it running Plex off a Pi. Okay. Um, but the, it's running through the network, and we've never had an issue. Wow. So, uh, and I mean, that's with some of our HD movies and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. I mean, even at one gigabit, it's been fine. Yeah. So I, I true mean, enough. True enough. So, I mean, Marshman does bring up a good point. If it's purely for network travel within your home, mm. is it really going to make a difference? Yeah. And so if that's the case, then I think the easy answer is same price, not going to make a difference. Of course you go with better. That way you yes. can say you've got but what is better, Jeff? That's the thing. What <laughs> defines better in this is instance? 3.1 a higher number than 3.0, so just by default, that's better. But you're still going to connect <laughs> that over USB 3.0 to right. your UASP on the Odroid XU4. So you're still going to be capping out at 5 gigabits per second. Right. But you're going to be losing the eSATA. Just right. wait for two years and then buy the next one. See? That's the solution. That's it. That's it. Just wait. Just you don't need like, to save anything. Just okay. delete all USB your files. Can you just minute, do like... You, like <laughs> USB 7.0. Like, <laughs> drop the mic. <laughs> 4.1. <laughs> so I, I think right now, we just need to say, okay, community, we want to hear from you. Which would you choose? Yeah. Based on everything yes. that we've discussed here. And then we're going to review it. We're going to actually bring it onto the show, and we're going to show you how this device operates and see what we can do with it. Does that sound fair? Yes. Yep. Jeff, are you going to buy the opposite? Uh, sure. 179 bucks. Hey, that's not bad. Not bad at all. You got to buy drives for it too. That's just the chassis. Oh. Yeah. You got to buy hard drives. Come on. You got to put storage in it. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. We do have to take a really quick break. Do make sure that you comment below. Let us know what you think, or if you're watching live, comment on the Discord as well. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Category 5 Technology TV. Exciting stuff going on today. We've just been talking about USB options from the uh, Twitter. Because Robbie was tweeting. <laughs> from the tweets. <laughs> from the tweets. <laughs> and now we're going to get into some coding. Because, yes. like, I'm a coder at heart. That's what I do. Yes. Day in, day out. And we always think of PHP. I mean, maybe that's a general statement. But do we kind of think of PHP as always being coupled with LAMP stacks, with Apache. It's a, it's a web language, right? Like, isn't right. that what PHP is? It's strictly for making websites. Exactly. Oddly enough, about an hour before I came here, I was showing Luke websites that I had made in the past and showing him the difference between ones that I had done with PHP and ones that were not with PHP. Like HTML? Straight HTML? Yeah, straight HTML. And he was nice. like, wow, there's a really big difference. I'm like, yeah? He's like, could, could I do that? I'm like, oh, buddy, there's so many cool options yeah. today. He's like, can I build a website with Scratch? Not quite. <laughs> not quite. However, what Luke is going to achieve by using Scratch is learning syntax. That's right. And syntax is really, really important. And what's neat about PHP versus HTML, so HTML is a static coding language for the web. Yeah. Or I, I shouldn't call it a coding language because I know I'm going to get some hate. It's a <laughs> markup language. It is text, right? Uh, and it allows you to include images and everything. That's the output that you see in your browser. PHP, on the other hand, is what's called a server-side programming language. So when you create something in PHP, if you're clever with it, you can do all kinds of stuff because it's a program running that then outputs HTML right. or XML or JSON or whatever you want it to output. But typically, it's going to be HTML. So you've created a program that runs under PHP, the environment, and the language, and outputs the markup of, say, HTML. So it creates the output to your browser. But it is, in so many essences, a programming language. Mm -hmm. And did you know that you can use it like a programming language? 
like a bash shell script. Imagine being able, Jeff, to, to program something that can connect to a MySQL database using the same techniques that you're used to for uh, building your websites, that can parse arrays and objects and output text and load things and explode variables into arrays and be able to do all kinds of things from the command line. Right. So now you've got something that you can create cron tasks with, mm -hmm. that you can connect to a, a MySQL database without having to figure out how to do it because you already know PHP from all your web work. That's right. So why not use that language within the command line as well? On Linux, hmm. you can cron tab it, you can do anything else. I have never thought about doing that. That is an interesting approach. Let's, let's take a look at my command line. And we're just, we're not going to get into advanced PHP here today, folks. That's not what this is about. What we're looking at is thinking of PHP as not just Apache backend. This is not all it's capable of. We're going to look at it instead as a programming language that you can use within Bash, within your Linux environment. So I'm just simply going to, I'm going to just jump right over here and I'm just going to, I'm in my home folder, home Robbie. I'm going to make der, uh, my app whatever it happens to be. And I'm going to uh, create a file now that is going to be called, what do we want to call this, Jeff? MyApp.php, right? Sure. Let's just say. So this is just a, a, a text file, if you will. Anyone who's familiar with PHP a little bit knows that that's kind of how you open and close a PHP file. And if I want to enter some PHP syntax, I can say, hello world. Right? Uh, hello world. Right. I mean, it all starts there. So That's I've written right. out that file. And what I need to have is a simple tool called, are, are you ready for this? PHP. PHP. Right? Well, right. Tec technically PHP CLI. But now I've already got it installed, but you can type uh, apt install, uh, and I need to be super user, so sudo apt install PHP. That's all you need to run, and it will install everything that you need. And now, if I run PHP myapp.php, I see Hello World. Nifty, right? right? So now that's pretty cool. I mean, that's cool. Um, I want to add. Uh, watch this PHP EOL, which is PHP end of line, which means that now when I run it in my terminal, it's going to add a carriage return afterwards. Oh, nice! So that it's not wrapping into my uh, my username like that. So that's kind of cool. Um, so of course, PHP being a programming language, I can do all kinds of stuff, like I was saying. But this now lets me run it within the terminal. And it's not really that exciting yet, because I'm still relying on the fact that I need to go PHP, home, Robbie, my app, my app.php, right? Mm -hmm. And it will run. Okay. So I'm going to show you the next step. This is where PHP becomes what we will call a, a terminal-based programming language. And that is to specify the environment within the file. You've seen bash files. So if I'm creating a shell script, this is, I'm going to call this my script.sh. And what do I start it with? Crunch bang, bin, bash. That's the environment that I'm creating. So that Bash or whatever environment I'm running it within knows that this code is meant to be run within the Bash environment. Okay? So similarly, can I do that with bin PHP? Well, sure I can. Because guess what? Look in bin. Look at all of the options that are in there. Whoa. LS bin, is there a PHP? No, there's not. <laughs> so what do we do if we can't do slash bin slash PHP. Well, watch this. Nano myapp.php. Let's go. Crunch bang. User bin env for environment PHP. Okay. Write that file out. So now there is a file called user bin env. There it is. Right? Let's do an ls. L-A-H. Whoop. I forgot a space there. There it is. User bin env. So now I've added that as my environment to the top of this PHP file and added PHP. So I'm saying run this environment 
PHP. Right. Okay. Now, I still can't go dot slash my app dot PHP. It's going to say permission denied. Well, I haven't created it as an executable yet. So I'm going to go chmod plus x my app dot PHP. So now <clears throat> I no longer have to go PHP my app dot PHP. No, I can go dot slash my app dot PHP and it runs as an application. Right. Okay. Now watch this. I'm going to move that my app dot PHP to hello. I'm going to actually name the script hello. Okay, so now watch this. Home, Robbie, my app, hello. That's the script. Run it. Hello world. Hello world. That's exactly what I've specified for it to do within PHP, and it's running it within the environment of PHP. So now PHP has become a command line environment for me to code in. I can connect to my MySQL wow. just like I would for my website. I can access XML feeds using simple XML. I can parse them. I can output JSON. I can import JSON and convert it to an array. I can do any of the things that I can normally do with PHP as a web programming environment now as a command line environment. You know, it's funny. I've never thought about using PHP in the command line. So this is like a whole new world of options. It's oh, very yeah. interesting. And as soon as you start wanting to create things, like let's say you want to create a webhook that allows you to post um, by cron job to your Discord server, right? And we do this. I have cron jobs that check our database, MySQL, uh, with PHP, a PHP script using the environment variable mm -hmm. that checks our database for new videos and then posts them to our Discord server. And when that works really well, it posts those videos directly to our Discord server because the cron job runs as a script in the, the term. Basically, it's running headless, but on right. a server. And it just runs like any other bash script, huh. but in the PHP uh, language. Interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, think about all the things that you could do with that. There is really no limit to using your imagination to create scripts that you can use uh, within the terminal. Now, would the really expectation of this be that, it's, that the PHP is running in the background, or can you flip back and forth so that it's running and then you're doing other things, or do you have to leave it solely as the, the primary function within your... You know, say you're running within the script itself. Yeah. If I follow exactly what you're asking, Jeff, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, are you asking if I was to swap back and forth between Bash and PHP? Is that kind of what you're going for? Well, no. Like, say you're doing this <coughs> on a Raspberry Pi. Yes. You know, you're running in the command line. If you're running some, you know, PHP functionalities, uh, you know, would this be the sole function for that device, or can it be something that's kind of running as a job in the background. I see. So this is just a single script, Jeff. Okay. So just like every shell script, just like every script where it starts with script, crunch bang, bin, bash. Every script that looks like that and now has some bash things going on. Okay. Right? That's a bash script. Right. So you can run that, then you can run your PHP. It can run as, as programs that you run manually. It can run as cron jobs that happen on a schedule. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the term cron job, that's a Linux term that refers to a scheduled task. So what you're used to in Windows is like scheduled tasks. A cron job is something that is a scheduled um, execution of a program, um, whether it's bash or PHP or whatever, as long as it's a script that your cron tab can, can see. Right. So, no, you can run as many things as you want, Jeff. This can be cool. just something that's running on your web server. So you, right. you, you could combine this with your LAMP stack and have it automatically put, it could connect out to the Twitter feed, um, download your current tweets, save them to your MySQL database, and then your website can access the database rather than having to go out over the web using the API. So then you, can reduce, you could reduce your API calls. Make it, it check. Make it check and save once per hour instead of once every time someone visits your website. Right. How great is that? And it, because it happens as a cron job in the background of your server, it never happens during the user's session. 
Right. They're only seeing it from your database. Just one example of how this could be used, right? I like that. So it's a local access for them. So. Very cool. So that is how to use PHP as a programming uh, language, essentially, in your uh, Linux command line. Uh, all you have to do is just add the environment variable, and you're good to go. And just make sure that you have PHP installed as well. Again, you can do that using apt-get or apt, and uh, just install PHP. Enjoy that. Let us know what you come up with and all the cool ways that you're able to uh, improve uh, things happening in the back end of your computer, of your server. So uh, any Linux device. All right, we do have to head over to the newsroom. Sasha, if you're ready, we'll head over to you. I sure am. Here's what's coming up in the Category5.tv newsroom. Raspberry Pi 4 are having problems with Wi-Fi when connected to high-definition displays. Someone pretended to be mayor, and the government gave him a .gov domain. Google has confirmed that a flaw that allowed hackers to take control of Android phone, cameras, microphones, and GPS locations without the owner's permission has been fixed. And a smartwatch advertised as a way to help parents keep track of their children and give them peace of mind can be turned into a frightening surveillance device. Stick around. The full details are coming up later in the show. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. I'm Sasha Rickman, joined this week by Jeff Weston. All right, some quick honorable mentions this week. Google wants to bring Android as close as possible to the mainline Linux kernel. A new breed of ARM-based smartphones, including the Librium 5 and the Pine Phone, are targeting mainline Linux support as a feature, and Google is clearly thinking along the same lines. Switching Android to run on the machine line uh, Linux kernel would be a huge undertaking, one that would inevitably require major technical and political changes to the way that the Linux kernel is currently developed. Instead of each Android device shipping its own device-specific Linux kernel, Google's idea is to upstream as much code as possible. In short, as reporter Ron Amadeo sums up, Google wants to decouple the Linux kernel from its hardware support. And Apple will have to face the law for, for distributing crappy keyboards. I love it. Apple's been trying to stop a class action lawsuit over faulty MacBook keyboards. Federal Judge Edward Davila has tossed out the attempt. The lawsuit accuses Apple of not only hiding the fragility of MacBook butterfly keyboards, but also failing to provide an effective fix or full compensation for customers who paid for repairs. The lawsuit covers many Apple laptops with butterfly keyboards, starting with the original 12-inch MacBook from 2015 and including MacBook Pro models produced in 2016 and later. Let's get into the top stories we're following this week. Raspberry Pi 4 are having problems with Wi-Fi when connected to high-definition displays. Can't connect your Raspberry Pi 4 to Wi-Fi? Try a lower resolution or a different HDMI cable. Developer Enrico Zini reported, quote, if the Raspberry Pi 4 outputs HDMI at a resolution of 2560 by 1440, the Wi-Fi stops working, end quote. Others have noted that the loss of 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi when using just 1080p resolution, but were able to solve it by switching to the 5 gigahertz band. There are reports that Wi-Fi performance is significantly degraded with monitors connected to HDMI 0. There is less degradation when the monitor is connected to HDMI 1. If you're experiencing this problem, the current recommendation is to use the HDMI port the lowest resolution possible, do not use Wi-Fi, or wait for the next hardware iteration that will hopefully fix the issue. Oh dear. I got wow. I got to say, I mean, I've never been a fan of Raspberry Pi Wi-Fi. Right. Plain and simple. So if I was using it as a multimedia PC, I'm going to go with Ethernet anyways, mm -hmm. especially now that they've got gigabit, but to think that now there's this issue that's cropped up. And it's surprising that it didn't come up before now because Raspberry Pi 4 has been marketed as being like the desktop PC of SPCs and, of course, the home theater PC of SPCs as well. That's how they've marketed, marketed it, even though there are more powerful boards out there. But Wi-Fi is kind of critical when you're doing a home theater PC. It, it really is. And, I mean, this is an... Uh an interesting problem to have where it's based on a specific port that's video based. I mean, right. we're talking HDMI, but suddenly when you're running at a really high resolution, it kicks out your Wi-Fi. 
and only on a certain band. I it's, mean, it it's feels to, it feels to me like interference, which is right. like, isn't this FCC compliant? Like that's that's how it feels to me. Well, it, it should be, but I mean, th- there's been a number of issues now with the Raspberry Pi Four, and it makes me wonder, like, how did this stuff get missed in the QC aspect of it? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Cer- certainly the USB-C issue comes to mind where it's not a compliant USB-C port. Right. That's a big problem. So you have to have specific cables in order to charge it or to power it. Is this a newly developing problem? Like, will they be able to fix it with an up? Great then, or you know, I don't know, Sasha. I, it yeah. seems to me like, like I say, it sounds like an interference issue, which sounds like something that uh, they would have to do hardware uh, yeah. improvements in order to fix that. And I, th- I don't know that it's a new issue. It's just that somebody finally made the connection that the Wi-Fi dropping out is with regards to uh, to the HDMI output. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, a- as you mentioned somebody had noticed that if you switch to 5 gigahertz versus yeah. 2.4 gigahertz it seemed to have better connectivity when you're connected to HDMI so really i mean it's actually a good news story that if all of them were having this problem at least there's a bit of a workaround sort of. oh sure <laughs> right yeah yeah, yeah. But, but then you do lose one at like you're now missing out on an HDMI port on your yeah. Pi. Yeah, you are. So, you, and, and there's a fine line. I mean, I think with single board computers too, we uh, there there are two sides of the user base. There's the side that I am, which is I know that it's a single board computer. I feel like it's groundbreaking and earth shattering, and the technology has been condensed from the supercomputer into a pocket sized device, and I'm so impressed. And if there's problems, I'm okay with that, and I'm like, I didn't pay a lot for this. And it's like, I'm like on the bleeding edge of what is next. And then there's the other side that's like, I bought this to have two 4K video outputs, and if I connect them, I can't work the Wi Fi. Right. And that's the flip side of it. And I can understand that side of it as well, especially for the non-techie, the non-tinkerer. Right. I'm a tinkerer. I want to play around. I, I, don't, I don't mind if things don't always work the way they're supposed to because I love to tinker. And I love, I'm going to be the one who buys the next gen because I want to see how it, how it progresses. Well, and, you, and you know, because you know that they really want excellence, that they're just going to push and, and make it better for the next gen, for but, sure. Yeah, absolutely. But there's so. this fine line also with the development process and the creation of the product where they're trying to drive down the price to $25, dollars right. And if they're going to do that with two 4K outputs and better Wi-Fi and USB-C, <laughs> like they're cutting corners, folks. They're like, you know, yeah. they are are cutting corners like crazy to make this thing happen yes so there's yeah you know there, there, you gotta you gotta put things into perspective i think sure. you win a little you lose a little That's yeah <laughs> um someone pretended to be a mayor and the government gave him a dot gov domain <laughs> A security researcher acquired an official .gov domain name to prove a suspected weakness in the system, which could have been used to spread fake emergency alerts or obtain private information about citizens. The researcher posed as the mayor of a small town with a population of less than 6,500 people. All they had to do was set up a fake Google voice number and Gmail address, both completely unaffiliated with the town. After that, they filled out an official authorization form, which basically asks for the same contact information a registrar would require. The documents needed to be printed on the town government's official letterhead, which the researcher obtained by searching for other official documents posted by the town online. According to a town clerk from the actual town, the only inquiry the city received from the GSA came 10 days after the researcher's fake registration was approved. And the GSA only called after the security researcher revealed what they'd done to a cybersecurity reporter who then inquired about the domain. In the short time they had the domain, which has since been revoked, the researcher was able to sign up for Facebook's law enforcement subpoena request system, which provides law enforcement and government entities with personal user records. Initially, .gov domain names were only available to U.S. federal government institutions. They've since been opened up to state and local governments. At the end of October 2019, a bill was introduced in Congress to improve oversight over government domains by the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Wow. So they were... Yeah. 
Wow. Yeah. Yeah, they did that. <laughs> like, I mean, Go ahead. you would think if there's somebody filling out an application for this before the <laughs> approval goes in, you'd start asking questions. But maybe we... Are we just a society that relies so much on the information on the internet that we believe what comes in on an application form? That is true, yes. And now, uh, to be honest, these .gov domain names, now that this story has come out, would you then not trust? Like, you should not trust them. You know that people can. I, I don't know if you could say you can't trust them, because, no. I mean, if I'm going to go to a .gov website, I, I mean, granted, they're mostly for, like we said, U.S., and a lot of that isn't going to apply necessarily right. for use here in Canada. Well, well we, we're we here in Canada, but remember that most of our viewers are in yeah. the United well, States, I'm, even yeah, though we I'm have viewers around the world. Yeah, perspective. Yeah. Sure. You know, it, it we have to be able to trust much, that this but, is trustworthy. But I would think, like, you're going to know what you're looking for. I, I mean, it's not like you're going to randomly search up, like, hey, this is nah. fake.gov. No, dude. Yeah. We're taught to trust that the lock means that it's secure. Yes. The .gov means that it's an official government website. Right. So, so in this instance, so could they not take the actual town website and create a phishing site mm -hmm. that now yeah, okay. collects your information and gets you to fill in forms that gives the hacker, it, this was a security researcher, but what if it was a hacker? Yeah, right. Okay. Fair right? Enough. The so good thing is that this, this is a guy just trying to expose a suspected Proving flaw, it can be done. And, and he did prove it and i mean that's good that it it ended well but it right. could have ended badly and so people need to maybe dial it back like they opened up the dot gov to maybe more i i guess more complacency by allowing local governments to sure. have it the right? scary thing about this and i mean maybe it wasn't random but the fact that one of the first things that this guy did was then get access to the Facebook information. Why right. not? Like, Continue proving the point. Well, yes. Exactly. But I mean, this this is then going to be one of those stories where people are going to go, oh, Facebook. That's, you know, it's like, no, no, no. Let's the focus on the real issue here. Like you, you right. trusted something that became untrustable. Yes. Untrustworthy. This, Whatever. This reporter <laughs> self reported, right? Like they turned but to a security expert, right? It wasn't like he went, Hey, this is what I've done. It, like he spoke to somebody who then inquired. That's the only reason they found out if that right. person didn't inquire, how long could this have gone on? I would have liked to know. I'm ha like, I'm happy not to know really. It would be scary, but how far could they have gone? Could uh, th to the moon? There's really? no end, Sasha. There there's no, no end. end. It, yeah. It's, yeah. and it opens up the question, how many other fake dot govs are there out there? Yeah. So be leery. I suppose. Yeah, we're, we always have to be careful. Always have to be careful, folks. We've got to take a quick break. The Crypto Report and more of this week's top tech stories are coming up. Don't go anywhere. Welcome to the CryptoCon. My name is Robert Koenig and I'm reporting to you from Florida, USA. I've got an international background, and as you probably can hear, <clears throat> it's a European one. I've been involved in this industry since 12, 2015 and occupied many roles, uh, starting with coding, running teams, supporting ICOs, and like most of us, also losing money uh, through trading uh, tokens. The Crypto Corner will uh, be split in two parts. The first one will be news, so what happened uh, during the last seven days. And the second part will be about a special subject. Uh, this time, we'll be talking about the private key. So let's dive into it. <clears throat> the market cap uh, of the industry has not cha really changed in the last seven days. There were some ups and downs, but it's hovering around 200 billion uh, US dollars. The Bitcoin <coughs> market share uh, is around 66%. Uh, so those things haven't really changed. What has changed is uh, some interesting news coming from uh, several countries. First one is India. India, uh, for the first time, is committing uh, to do a re some research on uh, blockchain technologies to establish a, a, a national framework uh, for blockchain technologies, which is great news because in the past they have been very negative towards uh, the crypto industry. Germany is <clears throat> starting with a new proposal 
law that would legalize uh, banks being able to hold cryptocurrencies. Uh, in the past, they had to go through th third parties, also the holding through third parties. Now they will be hopefully soon allowed to uh, hold them themselves. South Korea, South Korea has been always very positive towards the crypto industry, but they are now working on a bill that will provide a legal foundation uh, for cryptocurrency. So that's going to be interesting because, as I said, the leading edge and they, they have been always uh, very positive in this industry. Other news is Upbit, uh, the exchange um, went through, um, was hacked last week and they stole 342,000 Ether. Um, <clears throat> those are known where they are. So the wallets are known, although not uh, they don't know who the people are behind them. But remains to be seen what will happen with those either the big exchanges they all said they're not going to trade those either uh, into any other uh, cryptocurrency or into fiat. Uh, Bitfenix becomes the first major exchange to enable um, Bitcoin Lightning uh, support, <coughs> which is interesting because, as you know, Bitcoin Lightning is the second layer application uh, on the Bitcoin platform, which is equivalent to, or they want to have it equivalent to, um, a Visa uh, payment platform uh, in regards to speed and also uh, fees. And then uh, Binance is rolling out uh, Ethereum futures. So previously you could do uh, trade only uh, Bitcoin futures. And now you'll have also the possibility to trade in uh, Ethereum futures. Subject of the week is the private key. The private key is an essential part of a cryptocurrency and it ultimately defines who the owner of a coin or a token is. Let me give you an example. If you purchase some tokens through an exchange and you leave them on the exchange, then those tokens are not yours. They belong to the, to the exchange. Only once you transfer those tokens over to your wallet, like let's say for example Exodus or Trezor or Ledger, <clears throat> then those tokens will be yours. And that's defined through the private key. So always make sure that you are in possession of the private key and the easiest way to do that is through a wallet like Exodus, as mentioned Exodus, Trezor or, or Ledger. And that's it from me. So I'll see you next week and thank you for watching. Thank you, Robert. And for those of you watching, we do not provide financial advice about cryptocurrency. This is more so just an FYI for you so you know what's happening in the crypto markets. Google has confirmed that a flaw that allowed hackers to take control of Android phone cameras, microphones, and GPS location without the owner's permission has been fixed. The flaw was identified by security firm Checkmarks, which found, quote, multiple concerning vulnerabilities, end quote, in the Google camera app that enabled them to spy on its users. The issue, which also affected Samsung, meant that hundreds of millions of smartphone users were at risk. According to the firm, its team found that by, quote, manipulating specific actions and intents, an attacker can control the app to take photos or record videos through a rogue application that has no permission to do so, end quote. Checkmarks also found that certain scenarios enabled hackers to access stored videos and photos or to see GPS metadata embedded in photos that would locate a user. The firm was able to access these vulnerabilities using a mock-up weather app that only required basic storage permissions from an Android user. According to the firm, storage permissions are very broad and give access to the entire SD card. After identifying the flaw, the firm notified Google, which, after researching the report, found that the vulnerabilities were, quote, not specific to the Pixel product line and that the impact was much greater and extended into the broader Android ecosystem, end quote. The tech giant has since fixed the vulnerabilities and thanked the security firm for identifying the issue. Samsung has also released patches to fix the issue since it was discovered. That's a scary story. Yes. I, I mean, I am always one, whenever I download an app, I look at all the permissions and there are times where if I'm looking at two different comparable apps, yes. you know, in the Android store will tell me what permissions does it require? And mm -hmm. I will go with the one that has less access to my phone. 
but I have noticed with the access to file storage that it is everything. And that's been one of my chief complaints. And I would love to see on a future update that access to storage permissions is broken down to mm -hmm. save only, access only, specific areas. Yeah. Like I would like to see more definition with that. So these kind of things, hopefully, don't happen as often. Right. So yeah, the part that's scary is the fact that it would look like you're not giving that much permission. It's just for one thing. Right. But, it but really, the one thing is everything. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's, you know, with all the apps that people are producing, and I mean, we just went through this with my kids because mm -hmm. I found that they've been downloading apps that I have no <laughs> clue about on their phones. Right. And I'm like, what? A, why? Why? And what actually alerted us to it is my daughter asked, I mean, she's eight. Yeah. She asked me to, you know, to, to uh, do something on her phone with our dog. And I pop, like, I go to load the screen, like, full blown, unclothed oh. adult pictures from spyware and no stuff that's way. producing this on her phone. I'm going, come on. What have oh. you downloaded? And, and she's like, oh, I, I thought. Like, I didn't know. And I'm like, this is my daughter. Yes. Because of these apps that she's downloaded that I we had no clue. So I mean, we've fixed everything. But I'm thinking, come on. Like, we have to be more aware of what we download. And there's so much stuff within the app stores that just want access to your phone. It's like. Yeah. I have found that week after week reading stories like this, I download a whole lot less. I don't like change I, my device. My I, apps. Yeah. I know the ones I like and I trust. I don't need to be entertained by my phone, so I don't download entertaining apps. Um, For those of you who are watching this on your phone, ignore everything that she's saying. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, but it's scary, right? Because you see, you know, different apps are popping up in the news and they're doing, and, and they could seem so benign, but they're doing such harm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I guess the best thing to do is really just stay on top of. Yeah. I mean, at least do what you're doing. Read through what permissions, right? At least do that. And then also hope, like, for example, this has been patched since, since it was, the, the vulnerability was released, right? So. Right. Uh, you just kind of have to hope for the good in it all. Yep. Okay. A smartwatch advertised as a way to help parents keep track of their children and give them peace of mind can be turned into a frightening surveillance de device. Researchers at the AV Test Institute have uncovered gaping privacy and security holes in the SMA dash watch dutch dot dash m2 smartwatch the security lapses are so severe that the researchers were able to piece together a snapshot of the life and daily habits of a randomly selected 10 year old girl from germany oh my. among other data the chinese made device exposed the girl's name age place of residence where she spends most of her day and the routes she takes the researchers could even access the sound messages that were transmitted to her device and that's still not all. They were even able to monitor her real-time GPS position. Obviously, the security sh shortcomings didn't affect just that single device. The team said it could gain access to the location, phone number, photos, and conversations of well over 5,000 children, and was quick to note the number of affected users might in fact be far higher. The researchers found that in addition to communication with the manufacturer's server being unencrypted, the online interface of the manufacturer's server was completely unsecured, leaving it entirely open to external unauthorized access. Unauthorized access. Although an authorization token was generated to prevent unauthorized access, the server does not validate it, which essentially means anyone with enough hacking skills should have no problem in accessing user IDs. This allows potential attackers to have the same access that a parent would have. This lapse in security was found to affect users in Germany, Turkey, Poland, Mexico, Belgium, Hong Kong, Spain, the Netherlands, and China. Jeff, you don't look pleased. Yeah. I think as a parent, I mean, isn't it tough to think that, hey, this device that I bought, for, and I didn't, but rhetorical, that I buy for my child so that I can kind of keep track of where they are, and if they get lost in a mall, I can find them, and to realize that there has been little to no security consideration, it feels like a violation by the company who manufactures this, and that you 
are collecting and, and allowing this data to be accessible, but putting no effort into the actual security and protection. And, and as a software developer myself, that is my first consideration. Yeah. I've had payment processing websites that come to me and they say, well, why is it so expensive? And I say, because my first consideration is the security of the data of your customers. And that has to be the way it is. Yes. Uh, you know, I, oh my goodness, there's so many comments I could make with this. And it, 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 as a parent, this, this makes me feel ill. Like, yes. I mean, I would love to have, you know, fun tech stuff for my kids. And I mean, oddly enough, for C Cyber Monday and Black Friday, we were looking at getting smartwatches for our kids, yeah. ones that provided these kind of capabilities. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't pull the trigger because I didn't recognize the brands. Mm -hmm. They weren't reputable sources. They were good deals. Yeah. But <laughs> they weren't reputable yeah. names. And I'm going... Uh, can you trust this? Right. And, and I mean, I hear stories like this and I'm like, you know what? It's time to go off the grid. Like, right. <laughs> well, see, that's the thing. This is a really good idea. It's a really good concept. I mean, in my line of work, it would be really good for people with dementia or, you know, or children. It's really good to monitor the safety of people who are vulnerable. Mm. However, these people are vulnerable and it's really bad to exploit that. I mean, either with malicious intent or, or just complacency, right? I don't, like when when an idea is good like this, it needs to be followed up with the security that you know Robbie provides. <laughs> now this brings up a like a notification alert question within my head. Like I'm listening to this, I'm going and I'm thinking, okay, and, and Robbie is a security guy. Maybe you can weigh in on this. If you have a company that, quite frankly, doesn't care, right. they've been exposed for this issue, and they don't care. For them, it's about pumping out a device that is going to generate money for them and if, if it fails, whatever, they'll just open it up under a new name and do it again. As a parent who goes, this is a great option. But they may not be watching for these kind of alerts. Yeah. How as a parent do you catch the vulnerabilities with a device mm -hmm. like this if the company decides they're not going to alert you? you like, yeah. do, uh, does the industry have an alert system where all this stuff gets pushed out that a parent can go, I may not understand it, but I know that this alert says that product I got to right. deal with. I understand what you're saying. Like, you know, like when there's a tainted produce at the grocery store right. and there's a huge yeah. recall. I heard a alert. recall today and it's like the, the product yeah. that was recalled expired yesterday. So anyone who bought it has already eaten it or thrown it away anyways. Right. But so it's like, right. what good is that? From a security <laughs> standpoint for tech stuff, Right. Where parents can sign up for general alerts yeah. for this kind of stuff? Uh, you know, I don't know of one, but I'm sure there is. Um, and, and just backing up real quick, I don't want to take the assumption that the people who manufacture the device don't care. No, no. I, do, I just, it was a hypothetical. I, just, I know it's a hypothetical, but I just want to put that out there that sometimes devices are put out and, and a lot of times with these Chinese manufactured products, it's like it's a manufactured thing that gets picked up by a third party and that third party thinks, hey, this is a great idea, let's bring it to market and it all happens quickly and it all happens without really the security guy evaluating it, guy, gal, uh, evaluating the, the security implications and certainly this is a big one, especially as we look at right. things like COPPA and the protection of children and the monitoring of children and now being able to be exploited so easily. I, I don't know what to say. I mean, it's, it's just, it's bad practice all around, but we're feeding into it with the purchasing decisions that we make. And I think you made a good decision, Jeff, to say, yeah. I'm, I'm just not going to buy that. But then what do you do if you want those kind of functionalities? And maybe it's, okay, well, sticking with brands that you recognize and sticking with brands that have child-safe policies, perhaps. There must be some. I know, like, ESET has parental controls that you can install on their phone. Yep. If your kids have a, a mobile device that's uh, smart compatible, has internet connectivity, you can trace it using geolocation. And it's obviously, I mean, they're a security company. It's very well encrypted, and, and you are the only person who has access access to that data. So, you know, is that what we have to do? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not a cheap solution. No, it, it's not. And, and quite frankly, it comes back to a, a lot of times 
you pay for what you yes. or you get, get what, what you, you pay you, for. It, yes. And I mean, if you're, you know, for us, we didn't pull the pin on these smart watches for the kids yeah. because hey, it was a great price, but I just I can't trust the name. If yeah. I'm going to get a smart watch for my kids, I'm going to pay the two three hundred dollars for something from. Mm-hmm. you know, Samsung or an Apple, because I know that they're going to stand behind their security mm-hmm. if something goes awry. Mm-hmm. It's wow. it's a tricky time of year, too, because everybody really does want to get yeah. the newest and yeah. greatest. And Yeah. Uh, so maybe this is a bit of a, P- maybe this is it. Maybe this is the PSA to the parents out there who have purchased these cheap devices from China that, and, and just using this as the example, it's like, mm-hmm. be mindful. Okay. This has happened. This exactly. is happening. You need to be you need to be mm-hmm. protecting your kids. Crazy. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.tv newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash newsroom. From the Category 5.tv newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman. And I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Jeff West. Folks, we've got to take a really quick break. Stick around. Welcome back. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Sasha, you have some internet stuff. I do. Okay. So I live in a house. Now, Good. Dave, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's two apartments. In a so van I'm, down Dave by the river. I, yeah. Dave and I have an upstairs neighbor, um, and and we live downstairs, but right. we share the same internet. <gasps> okay. Now, we do without any problems, usually. Yeah. Except that I have Google Home, and she has Google Home, <sighs> and I have Spotify Premium, which <laughs> and she does by default she if she's sharing your because, IP address. Right, because you change your password, it doesn't matter. It's like on the same it's on the Wi Fi, yeah. right? So everything <sighs> changes. So the reason why I was alerted to this, I didn't even know it was a problem. Dave l- listens to Spotify far more than I do. But this is Sasha's husband. Yes, mm-hmm. but I, when I was driving home the other day, got an alert in my car saying that um, Spotify was playing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And I thought, well, that's not Dave. <laughs> <laughs> what, do you, yeah. Does it not link up to your phone or it, your, your device like because I know we have a lot of stuff is IP based my friend yeah, and, so, and a lot of tracking is IP based so you're going to start seeing advertising that belongs to the neighbor upstairs or right. uh, you're going to see like things that are related to their shopping habits over the holidays so what I need is a solution it's not it's not that I'm unhappy sharing yeah, yeah. these sorts of things sure. but I would like my stuff to be mine like, yeah. I can broadcast actually we were, after we realized the trouble of it I was broadcasting to her daughter daughter back and forth. <laughs> you right? can I chat was, you know, using your Google Cast devices. Exactly. Yeah. You know what really scares me about the scenario? And I love, I mean, hey, oh. let's, let's share, right? Yeah. You've got more than enough bandwidth. Sure. Okay. So in a rental unit like that, yeah, the, 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 sometimes we share our internet connectivity. But what is scary about this, Sasha, is you've got computers, right? Yes. Your neighbor, obviously, also has computers. Yes. What happens if they run a ransomware script on their computer? What uh. if they open that ransomware email you're connected to the same stinking so, network. You are on the same network, my friend. This is exactly why I'm having this conversation right now. Because okay. until that point, I didn't really think about it. And now yeah. I'm like, I need a, I need a thing. Like Spotify a, a, is one thing, right? But yeah. also all your private files that are yeah. on the same network. Okay. Could yeah. you think about that for a second. Okay. Yeah, could so you not I need a solution. buy another Wi-Fi... <laughs> No, Rabbit. I don't no. want to buy. No, no, no. Hold on. Yeah, hear, another hear, hear Wi-Fi. Me <laughs> like you guys are sharing the internet, so you're yes. saving money. Yes. So why not buy another Wi-Fi enabled router, then pick up like a fifteen dollar switch, and then run your feed from your actual modem into the switch, split off to the two routers. That way, you both have your individual home networks. No. Nope. Why wouldn't that work? Because what you're doing is you're creating two SSIDs. 
you're creating two WLANs, wireless LANs, okay? But those WLANs are both connecting to the same local area network, the same LAN. So the connectivity, it's like in, a, in an office building where you've got a warehouse in the back and the Wi-Fi doesn't quite reach there, you run a cable and you plug in another access point right. and it gives you access to what? The same network, right? Uh, so in this case, what, what the correct course of action I think Sasha would be, and, and you're, you're, you're almost there, Jeff. It's not a WLAN that you need, it's a VLAN that you need. Okay. So wireless LAN, that's one thing. But a VLAN is a virtual local area network. It allows you to create a virtual LAN within the current network or essentially separate from it. So without the authentication to access that VLAN, the neighbor would not be able to access any devices that are connected to your VLAN. Those could be hardwired, those could be wireless, it could be whatever. Now it is, Sasha, it's gonna require a device. Right. Um, I would probably look at, uh, you can start with like a $50 micro tick router um, in a small, you've got a small apartment, so that probably would work just fine. You can get a really decent micro tick for about 150 bucks. And oh. then that will give you like the, the really strong Wi-Fi signal. But I think you can get away with just a, like a cheap micro tick and set up a VLAN. It's a little bit complex to set up, but a VLAN will be a separate network from the existing one, but sharing the internet connection. That, see, that's exactly what I want, mm -hmm. right? Will, will the VLAN stop the ability of, you know, network attacks, you know, from ransomware and stuff like that? From from their LAN to the VLAN, yes. Because there's no cross-talking between them right. other than the internet. Right. So okay. if the neighbor was to open an email that had ransomware, right now your scenario, Sasha, the scary thing is, you have a Windows 10 machine. I do. It has Samba file sharing so that you can access your files from other devices. And so can your neighbor. Yes. They can also access your printer. They can also access your connected devices and, and everything mm -hmm. else. Um, if they click on a ransomware file, uh, a, an executable, by accident, because it comes in looking like an invoice at Christmas time, right. uh, or a shipment notification from UPS, and if they double click on that and run it, it goes out on the network and finds all the devices that are susceptible, which means Samba on a Windows machine, for example, and destroys all the files. So that's your personal data. So uh, yeah, putting so the VLAN separate from that will separate the two LANs. So a VLAN, would be enough. Uh, what's a virtual private network? Could I do that too? Like, should I do that too? That's what a different that? thing. Is v that a, thing? a VPN? Okay, just V. My, the, okay. Yeah, yeah. The, the V throws you the VPN, the virtual yeah. private network, is so that you can connect out to another network uh, that can be oh. used in like a business environment oh, so that okay. somebody can connect from home to their work in a secure method. Um, right. Some people will use that to be able to access other regions of the world. For example, uh, Netflix Canada doesn't have certain shows that they want, so they connect to a VPN in America. So that they can use Netflix America. Okay, right? so I need a VLAN. You need a VLAN yeah. to okay. separate your local area network into a virtual local area network so that it's separate and segregated from the actual physical local area network. Thank you. Yep. All mm -hmm. right. Does that bring us to the, t to the end? I think it does. Does that answer your question? I hope so. Microtick are fantastic because they make routers that are really, really affordable. And I say that like they are the price of a standard router, but the features of like the Cisco's, like you've right. got access to things like VLAN creation and, and advanced routing and things that you would normally pay thousands of dollars for, you've okay. got in a $100 router. It's Excellent. unbelievable. Can you find me one? Maybe put it up in the store or something? I can <laughs> sure. <like> Cat5.tv <laughs> slash microtick. Exactly. Now, I mean, there are no have, C's. If we have 30 seconds, there's one question in the newsroom similar related to this. In the chat? In the chat room. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, did I say the newsroom? You said the chat newsroom, room. yeah. Um, there, uh, so Sol Solbu is wondering, would like a guest net, having that separate guest net, would that be sufficient in this case? A guest network is different. It is different? Yeah. So that will solve the issue? No. Okay. Um, no, because that really is really to... <laughs> that would protect the neighbor but not you right okay because a guest guest network access on your router is it, just understand that what that's built for is so that if i have a friend over they can still use my internet but not access my files right so remember that keeps them from being able to damage my stuff 
but they can get damaged. Okay. Yes. Right. So yeah, it would protect the neighbor, but it wouldn't protect Sasha. Right. Okay. So that's that's mm. the distinction between them. It's a little bit different than a VLAN. Right. So. Okay. I mean, I'm. I don't want her to think I'm rude or anything. No. I'm taking back my Spotify because I don't <laughs> mind that she listens to it. I, it's just like, <laughs> it's it, it's just the this it's the symptom of a bigger problem. It, yes. Once that happened, I realized, whoa, now. Yeah. We've got some stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and you do have things like uh, you can only have so many devices on your Netflix account. Well, if right. they're on the same IP address, they're, I don't know. No, yeah, I guess that doesn't really count because they've got to authenticate as you. But but there are uh, d- uh, there are different services that use your IP. And, and I think about advertising at this time of year, too. <laughs> like, oh, my goodness. When my pastor was getting ads from the shared network upstairs for tattoos and stuff. And it's just like, <laughs> it's just, it just yeah. wasn't quite what she was looking for. Right. But those are the ads that she was getting served. That's so. hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that's all the time that we do have for this week, though. Don't forget, we're on Twitter at Category 5. TV. I personally am on Twitter at Robbie Ferguson. I follow back personally, so please follow me. I am very highly entertaining as well. You never know what I'm going to come up with. This week it's all about memes. I discovered uh, how to create my own memes, so it's fantastic. Oh, man, I've been doing that for <laughs> oh, years. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, I hope you have had fun with us this week. Uh, I sure have, and uh, it's been great having you here, and we'll see you again next week, and uh, hey... Have a great week. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.